As mentioned before, the actual plastic pressure is significantly more important than the hydraulic pressure. Machine independent pressure measurements should include back pressure, pressure at transfer and or peak pressure, pack pressure, hold pressure. Most injection molders overlook the importance of documenting the weight of the molded part. It's important to document the fill only weights, the fill and pack weight, and the final part weight. When available, document process data such as cavity measurements, quality measurements, clamp tonnage, take photographs, any observations, and the cavity balance. As with processing, a scientific molder also uses a scientific approach to troubleshooting. The first step in this process is to examine the part to ensure proper diagnosis and that no other defects are present. Many times there's an improper diagnosis or another defect that's also present. In either case, the scientific troubleshooter needs to properly get the information and identify in order to perform his or her job properly. Step two is to rule out any of the obvious cases. Check the simplest causes whenever necessary. For instance, if the part has splay, check the moisture in the material or the dew point. The best place to check the dew point is at the feed throw of the hopper using a portable dew point meter. If your plant doesn't have one, this would be a wise investment as it can be used on a regular basis to check processes around your plant. It's also more accurate than the dew point taken just away from the dryer since the probability of picking up moisture from the dryer to the machine is much greater as the equipment is located further away from the dryer. This simple approach applies only to a few defects. Flash, shorts, delamination, and so on are much more complicated and require a thorough approach. Step three, a scientific molder needs to compare the existing process outputs to the documented process outputs. This step is what really differentiates a scientific molder from an everyday firefighting technician. Any molder knows that the process inputs can be identical from one day to another, but the resulting molded part can be completely different. A scientific molder knows when all the process outputs are identical, the molded parts are the same. Step four, return the process to standard. Change just one parameter at a time and allow each change time to affect the process. Again, when the process is properly documented, and the process outputs are the same, the molded part should be the same. Step five, make sure the entire process is the same. In this case, where a process output has been changed, it's important to verify the other outputs to ensure that other things have not shifted. One of the biggest benefits to this approach is that a big issue can be identified quickly and decisively. For example, let's suppose your material is degrading, but the melt temperature and plastic back pressure is identical to the previous process. You can quickly suppose that there is something wrong with either the material or the equipment. Without good data, you're only guessing. This costs the plant time and money. Lastly, a scientific troubleshooter writes down everything. All molding facilities that operate smoothly have a process change sheet or process log to document their processing actions. 
employees will avoid such documentations for two reasons. One, they cannot remember or explain what they did and why. Or two, someone will use this documentation against them in the future. No plant should attack an employee for following procedures, nor should they ever insult a processor for their approach to processing. In order to encourage scientific molding, you need to nurture an open dialogue on processing focused on learning and rationale. So to reiterate, the scientific troubleshooter uses documentation to know how the plan ran and how the process is running, determine what has changed, act on that knowledge, verify the results, and be able to speak in specifics. Any processor should focus on becoming a scientific molder, regardless of which route you take to become proficient, you know, education is the key. Learning, such as online training, classroom training, walking around a trade show, participating in webinars like this. And then work on skill development, such as simulation software. Practice on the job, then also practice hands-on exercises that directly relate to your job and to your job responsibilities. Next, I'd like to discuss some of the common tests used by scientific molders. Your plant may have a different more or more detailed worksheets. As long as you're performing these tests on mold, machine, and process, that's what's important. The intent of this section is to acquaint you with the type of scientific data you can obtain from your process and your equipment. When evaluating the mold, the types of tests you can perform include dynamic cavity imbalance test, mold deflection test, and a tonnage calculation. The dynamic cavity imbalance test is a test which determines the percentage of cavity imbalance during filling. A high imbalance, such as 6%, can lead to inconsistent fills, shorts, flash, and other related defects. In such a test, you mold short shots at different speeds, you measure cavity weights, you determine the variation, and then you determine the optimal fill rate. Very few injection molders really know much about their molds during injection and packing. In some cases, we've seen companies test this where there's a problem such as flash. Unfortunately, if you don't know the typical deflection of the mold, you'll not know if there's a change or cause for concern. Since it's nearly impossible to place an indicator on the mold directly, deflection can be determined indirectly by measuring the movement of the injection unit. To measure this, place the dial indicator in contact with the injection unit of the machine. Clamp the mold under tonnage, zero out the indicator, and then determine the average deflection for five repetitive cycles. Very few injection molders calculate the tonnage necessary to clamp the mold. Although we're not going to get involved with the mathematics involved, you can do this relatively easily by measuring and sketching the mold in determining the surface area parallel to the platens and then calculate the necessary tonnage. When evaluating the machine, the types of tests you can perform include platen deflection test, dynamic check ring repeatability test, and a load sensitivity test. As with mold deflection, Platen deflection can also be measured pretty easily. To measure this, place an indicator in contact with the stationary platen of the machine. Zero out the indicator, and then again determine the average deflection for five consecutive cycles.